<sighs> okay, all right. Hello everyone. So as you can tell, we have another fairly intense subject to cover and it was not one that I saw coming. We're gonna be talking about the allegations against Andrew Callahan of Channel 5. And I know this one has been talked about a lot probably by the time you all see this video, but new things are always coming out. It's still very much a developing story and I do not wanna cover this as like a drama thing, a tea thing, or even like just like quoting what has been coming out in the news. I really wanna analyze what's been happening. Yes, the allegations, talking about those, but also the public reaction to what was said, how people have responded to it more recently, and I think talking about the larger issue of coercion in relationships and how Andrew was just like one example of this kind of thing happening if we are taking the allegations as stated as being true and turning that into a larger conversation about something that I think is a really, really common and also completely undiscussed problem in dating culture, at least in America. So if you guys don't know, because I do not know how much overlap there is between Channel 5 and my audience, Channel 5 and Andrew Callahan are a very popular, like man on the street interview style YouTube channel. And this originally started as All Gas, No Breaks, which ran for two years in 2019 and 2020, and then came to an end after there were some conflicts between Andrew and his network, really classic YouTube stuff. In order to continue making the kind of stuff that he was making on All Gas, No Breaks, they then moved over to Patreon, got a lot of support, and then started Channel 5 as a new version of that away from their network. And it was instantly really popular because not only were they doing these like on the street interviews of like really diverse people, he had a really unique style of doing it. Like he could go anywhere, he could go to Daytona Beach, he could go to a QAnon rally, he could go to a pickup artist convention, and he could just go there and let people talk because this was all based on the principle of what he called radical empathy or like radical listening, of just letting people talk and not really interrupting, not putting in your own bias, not really asking pointed questions, just showing people as what they are and how they would describe themselves. And that instantly gained him a lot of recognition because it was very unique. And also from basically every side of the spectrum, people really respected that because he was seen as being this like good, honest journalist at a time when anti-mainstream media narratives were really starting to gain a lot of traction. And this trust that he gained both from people that were watching him and from people he was interviewing really gained him a lot of access, a lot of like cachet that he would not typically get if he was operating as like a vice reporter or somebody from CNN. He, just to give you guys a sense of this, he was so well regarded and he had such exclusive access to people that he not only talked to Alex Jones, he also got access to one of the most visible figures of January 6th, the QAnon shaman. And it really seemed like his career was going on this like upward trend. He was gaining popularity. He was getting mainstream success and attention because he actually ended up working with HBO to release, I think about like a 45 minute documentary about the events leading up to January 6th. And it was huge. It was really widely talked about both on social media and then in everyday life. Like it was something that got a lot of attention. It really seemed like he's just about to break through to mainstream success and maybe actually maybe get to work with HBO on a regular basis and have his own show. And then it all came crashing down a couple of days ago. So between December 30th and now, December 30th being when the documentary was released, and starting a couple days after that, there were allegations against him that started to come out originally on TikTok. More specifically, on January 5th, a TikTok user named Caroline put out a video with allegations against Andrew Callahan, saying that he had told her he needed a place to stay for the night and that after she had made it clear that she did not want anything involving sex to happen, they then went to a bar where Andrew allegedly plied her with additional alcohol, trying to get her drunk on purpose to wear her down and then coerced her until she said yes to sex, even though she had just said she did not want to do anything sexual. 
and a follow-up TikTok to this original one. She also included some screenshots of texts from him and also a photo of them at this bar together because it was a well-known local spot. She also included some TikTok messages and comments she'd gotten from other people, basically saying, you know, sharing stories of, oh, this happened to me, I know someone who went through this and so on to support her allegations against him. In a follow-up interview with The Stranger and with Rolling Stone, Caroline added some additional details about her experience. Quote, Caroline says that she initially met Callahan at the Benz, a dive bar in St. Petersburg, Florida. She approached Callahan, who was with a woman who appeared to be his girlfriend as a fan of his content. A few months later, they agreed to meet up when Callahan was in Miami and exchanged Instagram DMs, screen grabs of which Caroline later posted on TikTok, along with a photo of her posing with Callahan. Callahan appeared to be in distress, telling her that he had a falling out with a crew member, she says, and asked if he could stay at her place, which she agreed to. Caroline says that because she had met Callahan while he was with another woman, she did not initially think their meeting was romantic. I was under the impression that Andrew had nowhere else to stay that night. I now realize that was naive, she said. At the time, I thought my only option was to cave in to what he was repeatedly asking of me and ignoring all of my different versions of no. No, I'm tired. Sorry, I have to be up early. Is it okay if we just go to sleep? I'm really tired. I thought I just had to make the night end. Frozen in fear, I thought that was my only option. Caroline said this night brought back trauma from when she'd previously been assaulted. The first time I was sexually assaulted by someone else, I was 14. I continuously said no, but he used his strength to pin me down and force himself on me. When I did finally manage to push him off after a few minutes, he went crazy. When the situation happened with Andrew years later, I was immediately brought back to that moment when I was a child. A lot of skeptics are asking why I didn't do more to prevent myself from being coerced. It was fear. You might think that you know someone, but you never know how they might react if you don't give them what they want. The day after Callahan crashed at her place, Caroline told multiple friends about the incident. Caroline also texted Callahan several times. In one of his replies, he said, the last thing I wanted to do was to make you feel any sort of pressure whatsoever. In those messages, he later acknowledged that their encounter and his persistence had brought up trauma from past situations for Caroline. And you might think after hearing all of that, that people took this initial allegation seriously, people believed this individual, and that is not what happened. People were very skeptical. People did not really know what to think. They really focused on like picking apart what she said and her words going right for like, okay, well, but you did eventually consent. You did eventually say yes. Yeah, so how can this actually really be assault? And we'll talk about that later. But also pointing out, you know, she had called Andrew an abuser and her abuser and people were saying, okay, well, but if it was only just this like one time thing, how can you really call that abuse? Is an abuse more of an ongoing thing, not just like a one-time thing. And then also, especially those like TikTok replies she added in in that second TikTok, that I think really got people to be skeptical because there was a lot in there and some of it was, you know, valid and as we'll see in a moment, very much supported a trend. But there were others that were very much like rumor mill type allegations like, oh, I heard someone who knew someone who said or, I heard a rumor that he's like this kind of a person or even kind of like making inferences based on very little evidence like, oh, I heard that he has been with people who still live with their parents and so he is like 99% getting with people who are underage. And as far as I'm aware, none of the allegations that we'll talk about in this video involve anyone who was underage at the time they were with Andrew. There are lots of stories out there. I'm not gonna cover all of them, but I think hearing even just this one TikTok, people were very closed off and they were very much thinking, oh, this is like a fluke, a one-time thing. How can we believe this one person? Like I've never heard anything like this before. And people quickly found out it was not just a one-time thing because pretty shortly after, a few days later, there was a second TikTok user who went by the handle of Moldy Freckle, who shared her own allegations. Uh, the story starts with her DMing him in 2019, during which time they would hook up occasionally, but she eventually decided that she did not really want to be around Andrew anymore. She got kind of like bad vibes from him, didn't want to be around him, didn't want to hook up anymore, but he basically wanted to apologize to her in person 
And so they ended up meeting up kind of one last time. And then when they were together in the car, he then escalated things into trying to get kind of like one last sex out of the relationship, basically trying to put her hand in his pants, trying to put his hand in her pants. And she was so frightened by what happened and felt so trapped that she didn't really know what to do and tried to kick him out of the car by driving very erratically. And then eventually he did end up getting out of the car and on reflecting on her side of things on their relationship thinking back on things and remembering when they still were on good terms she recalled how he would oftentimes try to worm his way into getting to spend the night acting as though he didn't have anywhere else to stay which reinforced that allegation from the first TikTok. Now after this, on January 13th, The Stranger released an article covering these allegations. We talked about it a little bit before earlier with additional comments from Caroline about what happened between her and Andrew allegedly. But not only did they have more information from Caroline in that article, they also had allegations from two new women that we had not previously heard from, Anna and Jane. Anna, a pseudonym for another woman who spoke to The Stranger, said she went to the same middle school as Callahan in Seattle. Later in the summer of 2016, when she was 18 and Callahan was 19, she said she matched with him on the dating app Tinder. From the jump, I was caught off guard by how quickly the tone of the evening shifted. At one point, Andrew, I assume purposefully, poured wine on my shirt and proceeded to take off my shirt and then lick the wine off of my bare chest. This happened very abruptly and I completely froze up. I felt unsafe and incredibly violated. After providing many physical cues of my discomfort, I eventually made it clear verbally that I was not interested in continuing things. He wasn't taking a simple no for an answer, and consequently, it turned into me trying to make up an array of excuses as to why I didn't want to have sex. He kept insisting that I needed to get him off because I was giving him blue balls by not having sex with him. He repeated that phrase many times, Anna said. It was a long back and forth of him trying to guilt me into sexual acts. In the interview, one of Anna's friends said she told him about the incident at the time. Anna also showed the stranger screenshots of messages she sent to multiple people between 2019 and 2020, outlining these same allegations. Jane said she first met Callahan in Seattle at the Madison Park dock in the summer of 2017, while she was hanging out with some mutual friends. Basically, right off the bat, I let him know I wasn't interested. However, the following year, she ran into him again when they were both in a Lower East Side bar in New York, she said. I had already been out with some of my friends throughout the day, so we were really drunk, Jane said. Everybody was hanging out. At first, everything seemed normal. At some point, we went to an upstairs area there. There were some other people there at first, but they left. Then, he just started making moves on me. Kissing me, groping me, moving my hands to touch him, forcing my head down. She said she wasn't sure how to respond, but she tried to get away from Callahan only for him to follow her. He said he was also drunk as F in New York before sending a heart message along with a request to see her again. Jane said his response made her uncomfortable and she blocked him after she felt that he dismissed her concerns. And the stories don't end here because as these allegations began to gain some traction, people did some digging and they found some stuff. They found screenshots from 2020 and 2021 that seemed to show even at that time that Andrew had a bit of an MO. And these were not necessarily direct allegations, but they were stories from people trying to warn others who had seen their friends interact with him or had heard about it afterwards, that he would basically try to exploit alcohol and his increasing fame in order to get people to have sex with him. And so at this point, this means we have at least four like pretty solid allegations, either directly from the people who are making the allegations or people who were interviewed by reporters. And then we have a smattering of like, I'd say four to six, like fairly solid stories from places like TikTok and Instagram and so on of people sharing other secondhand experiences. But in all this, where's Andrew? We haven't heard anything from him. What is his side of the story, right? What does he have to say for himself? And starting from January 5th onward, it was basically radio silence. We did not hear anything from Andrew. The first little peep we got actually was from Ethan Klein, who was somebody who had promoted Andrew's work, who had talked to him before. They appeared to be friendly, if not exactly like friends, 
and there was a members only live stream that he did where he said that Andrew had talked to him over the phone. He said that he was in a psych ward and that what the girls were saying was true. And that was something that we kind of initially thought, okay, we have confirmation. We might not hear anything else. And then there was a statement that Andrew's lawyers made on TMZ, which seemed to go against what was said secondhand from Ethan Klein. Andrew is devastated that he's being accused of any type of physical or mental coercion against anyone. Conversations about pressure and consent are extremely important and Andrew wants to have these conversations so he can continue to learn and grow. Adding, while every dynamic is open to interpretation and proper communication is critical from all those involved, repeated requests for money should not be part of these conversations. A source with direct knowledge tells us Caroline requested money from Andrew, referencing the fat check he got from HBO for his documentary. She allegedly asked to be paid just minutes before the doc aired. We're told Andrew didn't pay up and Caroline uploaded the TikTok a few days later, urging others to come forward, which is exactly what happened. So rather than addressing the numerous allegations against him, his lawyer's technique was to instead focus on one allegation and frame it as a blackmail scenario. And you know what? It's a pretty good technique, right? Getting people to go, all right, you know, don't look at the forest, ignore the forest, only look at this one tree because it's the most important. Get out a little magnifying glass, you know, put up your monocle or whatever, and look at the moss in a lot of detail. That's all you need to look at, that's all you need to think about, everything else is irrelevant. And you know what? It really works sometimes. That reframing, that refocus, that can really help you in a defense for things like this. But I don't think his lawyers anticipated what happened next because this is the internet and things leak. And there was a text message that people are alleging is the text that Caroline sent. And you can read it, you can look at it in full and you can decide for yourself, is this blackmail? And you know what I gotta say, reading through it, I don't really think about it as being blackmail. It reads to me as somebody who is pissed off and angry that somebody who hurt them is getting even more money and they feel like they did not ever really get a true apology and that this person never really made amends or changed their behavior. And I certainly know lots of people that at least daydream about the idea of like fucking therapy is expensive. Why can't I send my ex my therapy bill? I would love it if I could give like an itemized list to my ex of everything they owe me monetarily for my pain and suffering. But you know, in this scenario with a D-list internet celebrity, it can seem more like blackmail than just like the type of thing you would talk about with friends. And you can certainly read it in that vein. You can take it as like, oh wow, she's only really coming out about this because of the money she wants. But I don't, it doesn't sound like she's like threatening a lawsuit or like that if you don't do this, I'm gonna do this. Like it doesn't really read the way that I would expect like blackmail to read, you know? And this was something that I read in a few comments, I think it was like really interesting as an idea, as a concept, is for some reason, with basically any other type of injury, we expect that people will ask for compensation and we don't really begrudge them that fact. But when it comes to crimes that are sexual, injuries that are sexual and then mental in nature, we think it's dirty to ask for money. And when it comes to things like, oh, you're at work and like somebody drops a heavy box on you and then you break your arm, compensation, totally fine. You get in a car accident, somebody rear ends you, you know, you get whiplash, also fine to ask for compensation. You're at work, your boss is skimming your paychecks or stealing your tips compensation. All those things, totally fine to ask for compensation. But for some reason, when you get assaulted sexually, you should not ask for money. It's dirty, it's gross, it's wrong. And I almost feel like part of this is like purity culture at work, you know, where people are still even maybe like subconsciously thinking about sex as this like dirty thing that lowers you. And that by being assaulted in some way, it's kind of like you participated in a sin against yourself. And so you're already sinful. 
greed would be even more sinful and so you're just like lowering yourself even further into sin by like asking for money because it's like oh well money wouldn't really make you whole because being assaulted sexually isn't like a physical like real world issue it's a spiritual problem and you don't solve spiritual things with money you solve it by asking for forgiveness and redemption and, and looking towards your savior and you know like you're supposed to heal spiritually and be this like very pure you know inward sort of person where you work on like purifying yourself after something like this not like trying to be made whole financially for your emotional suffering and that you're supposed to act like this very like demure humble like quiet person that's like oh i accept my role and what happened to me and i only want to heal and you know not being too loud not taking up too much space just like trying to heal without making anyone else uncomfortable and asking for money seems to make people uncomfortable so that entire framework is entirely out even though as i've already said after this very likely you're going to need therapy and that therapy is going to be expensive like hundreds of dollars per session so i don't really know why we expect people who have been assaulted to pay for their own therapy when we don't expect the same thing for medical bills when you have a work injury or you got in a car crash it just does not really make sense to me and in reality at the same time asking for money does not mean that you're lying you can be totally innocent and be after a million dollars in a lawsuit you can be lying out of your teeth and performatively being like, oh, I don't really need anything. My justice is all internal. I only ask that they do better in the future. Like, you can lie and want nothing. You can be telling the truth and want a million dollars. It doesn't really matter as much as people like to frame it to matter, you know? Getting back to Andrew, right as I was finishing up the script for this video, he dropped a response video not an apology but a response video and this was really interesting because he says things like he never overstepped that line when it came to always taking a no for an answer like he was always able to take a no but he did also say he had some like sex pest behavior but then kind of justified it by saying it was normalized and that he thought that what he was doing was just totally normal and he does a lot of these kind of like half acknowledgements, never really apologizing, but trying to be sympathetic and understanding, saying that many of the stories are missing really important contextual information that I think would change people's interpretation of a lot of these situations. But also saying that he thinks alcohol really contributed and that he'll be getting sober and getting into therapy as well. And the response to this response video was very mixed i would say you got a lot of people saying oh andrew you're so brave thank you for saying this you don't owe us anything and then you had people going this is actually really manipulative and i think i'm not sure how much of this is like lawyer speak versus his actual feelings but the impression i get is that lawyers are anticipating a civil suit so they do not and possibly criminal i don't know so they do not want to get near admitting fault in a public response they want to be able to sound sympathetic and nice but also not say i apologize i hurt you or i'm sorry about what i did there can be no admitting fault you have to be able to put up that defense barrier first so his apology his response because he did not even call this an apology does not really go as far as I think a lot of people would want to see and especially with the framing of like well actually you don't really know the full story yet but I can't tell you what that is and you know I apologize for you know whatever and I really think alcohol is the problem like it just does a lot of like very careful language that's very calculated and I gotta be honest at this point I don't, I don't really want to see youtube apology videos i feel like there was a time on youtube for certain things that were like on platform issues where it was like you know a scam or a bad sponsorship or something where having 
an apology made sense. But I think especially since we've seen things like, you know, maybe what's happened with like Chris Ilia most recently, where you can apologize, you can say, I'm getting into therapy, I'm doing 12 step, I'm going into a sex addiction program. And then you find out that they were just doing the same fucking behavior the whole time. They just wanted to save face. And so for me, I think with so many issues in life, I'm really coming down on, okay, I don't really care what it is that you say. I care about what you do. I want you to do better. I don't want you to say you're doing better. Just shut the fuck up. Apologize privately to the people who need to be apologized to. I, the audience, the people of the public, do not need are not owed an apology or an explanation. Keep that shit to the people that it actually matters to. Be as honest as you can in that. Then get offline, do the freaking work, shut up in the meantime, and possibly come back if it's a kind of like soft edge case scenario of like bad communication techniques or whatever. Then maybe come back to the public in a couple of years when you've actually changed as a person in your behavior, not like, I'm gonna apologize and then go on a comedy tour and visit 30 states and, and not really change my life in any meaningful way or go away for like three months and then come back and do like, you know, shows again or whatever. Like, I am just so done with apology videos because at this point, they are really just extensions of PR statements. They don't really actually mean anything. They're not really actually apologies, usually at this point. They are just people trying to not piss off an audience that is paying them money, right? They want to be able to maintain the Patreon, maintain, you know, money on YouTube, AdSense, whatever. And so they are trying to desperately hold on to some kind of good opinion. And they realize they can get people who want to believe them to feel comfortable staying loyal to them if they put out like a really mealy mouth, not really that committal statement. Cause they can go, oh, well he apologized though, he apologized though. How many times have we heard that from people who want to defend people who have had horrible allegations against them and then go, oh, but he apologized though, he said sorry. Like, no, sorry. Like apologizing to an audience does not matter. It is the victims, the people making allegations that matter, not us as an audience. I think we really need to let go as a culture as internet people, we really need to let go of thinking that random people we are not involved with owe us an apology because that is shifting the focus in the wrong direction. So now that we have gone over all the allegations, kind of my thoughts about like his response, and you know what? This is very much still developing. So for all I know tomorrow, there's gonna be a new bombshell, huge allegation with like a fucking video of it happening. You know, who knows at this point? I, I think that compared to a lot of the allegations we've seen historically in the last couple of years, there are a lot of people speaking out. There's a lot of like screenshots of text messages and photos together that I think are more than we're used to seeing for things like this, but people are still very skeptical because of the nature of what happened. People are very willing to say, oh, but they did eventually consent, right? Like. He may have been pestering them, but like, that's just what you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to, you know, get what you want. You're supposed to like be aggressive, you know, close the deal. And as long as you eventually get to a yes, the 15 no's beforehand don't really matter. And I think that they should because coercion is a very big issue in relationships, in dating and hookup culture. People have this idea in their heads that sex is a combat sport or it is at least a competition and somebody a woman usually has the thing you want but will not give it to you so you have to fucking do whatever magic trick convincing guilt tripping thing you need to do to get that thing away from the woman right and get her to give it to you it doesn't matter how many times she says no. It doesn't matter if she tries to physically move away or make excuses or go to her car or call a friend or whatever. As long as you eventually get to a yes, all of the other stuff doesn't really matter because you got a yes. And I feel like this is like sort of like the, the rules lawyering that happens when the only message that you receive about sex is like, oh, get consent first. Like it is not nuanced enough to just say get consent because at least to people going, oh, as long as I can get consent as in like extracting consent from the other person, like you juice out of a fruit, 
I can do what I want, right? I just have to get to consent. The process of getting consent is very much forgotten about. And there is a very real difference between just saying, hey, do you want to do this? Somebody immediately going yes and asking 20 times and getting a no, a no, a no, and then getting a sure, I guess, whatever, you know, like you got to pay attention to those nonverbals, to those verbals. If somebody is saying no, don't fucking do it. I don't know why this is so hard for people to understand. Like, why do you want to have sex with people who don't want to have sex with you? And I think what I've really come down to about this, and you know, this is hard for me because I, I'm not like a normal heterosexual. I really feel like it's less about I want to have sex because I want to have an enjoyable experience with somebody else where we are both having a fun time. It's I need to get sex because if I don't have it, I am a loser. If I do not have sex with a person on a regular basis by any means necessary, I am lame, I'm a nerd, I'm a weirdo, not a real man, I'm emasculated, like run down the list, right? Like being able to obtain sex is a really big thing for a lot of people and they genuinely do not care how they come by it or what the other person thinks about it or how drunk they are. Let's get into that for a second, right? Like we can say in a completely sober scenario between two people that yeah, you should be good about setting firm boundaries. You gotta just be a broken record about saying no. And as far as I'm aware, that's what these people did. And if you then say yes, after all of that, it's still assault, it's still coercive. But to add alcohol on top of that makes it so much worse, makes it so much worse because then people are still defending another level of coercion where it is not only coercive to ask for a yes over and over and over again, physically trap people, isolate them, whatever, but also it is very much coercive to ply someone with alcohol because we know that when people drink, when they are under the influence, they are more pliable. They might agree to things that they might not otherwise agree to. And they are not able to fully consent. Being impaired means you cannot give true, enthusiastic, affirmative, whatever language you wanna use consent because you are inebriated. Your decision-making ability is not running at full blast. That is what happens when you are under the influence. And so people exploit that on purpose in order to get to a yes when they might not otherwise be able to. And depending on how inebriated somebody is, they might not be able to say anything at all, right? They could be blacked out, they could be passed out, grayed out, whatever. And then they definitely really can't consent. I'm really scared we're gonna start seeing allegations about Andrew or other people where it wasn't just coercion with people who could actually communicate. It was people being blacked out, people being passed out and him taking advantage of that completely. And the other element of this is that he says he was also drunk. And something we've seen from other allegations, like with Christelia, is that like he would get people drunk, but he would stay sober. This is different from that in that he was also very drunk. But him being drunk does not fully excuse this by any possible explanation of the facts. Like, yes, you have like a little bit of like diminished capacity, but you, you at some point realize you have a problem where when you get drunk, you go after people sexually. And you can choose to remove yourself from those scenarios. You can choose not to drink, you can choose not to go to parties. You can choose to have a friend slap you in the face whenever you get close to a woman at a party. Like you have options here, okay? And when you realize you have a pattern where you get drunk, you get forceful, you get pushy, you know, you can choose to make different decisions about the scenarios you put yourself in and Andrew did not make those. And keep in mind, this is a production. Andrew goes around the country with people, right? He has a crew, he has a team. And I find it very difficult to believe that this was not a known issue. There was one story that came up on Reddit that, you know, it's a Reddit thing, so a huge grain of salt with this, that basically said, I was at a lot of shows that he did recently. He was always very, very drunk and it was a known thing. It was like an open secret. And I am not sure how true that is, but if all of these stories are involving him getting really, really, really drunk, 
I have a hard time imagining that he's not that way elsewhere at other times or that this was a complete unknown to the people that were with him. And if those people are not holding him accountable, like who else is going to be able to? And I feel like this may be a situation of somebody enabling someone else, you know, in terms of, you know, oh, that just Andrew's how he is. He's just kind of a weirdo. He's kind of a freak. That's what he's got to do to get pussy. Like, there's a million ways to justify this amongst, like, guy friends of, like, oh, yeah, he's just, like, kind of aggressive. He's kind of flirty. He kind of, you know, blah, blah, blah. And if you just normalize it that way, it's never going to change, right? Like, if you're around people who enable your bad behavior, your bad behavior is not going to change very easily. So I'm kind of, like, wondering, like, about the crew and how much they knew. And, I, like, I just, again, like, somebody else had to know that was around him that closely for so long that he had a history of creepy behavior, you know? And coercion, I think, can very much be normalized by people because of how we treat getting a yes in this culture, as I've already talked about. And coercion is assault. Being coerced into sex is a violation. It is going past your boundaries because you have to state your boundaries and then be coerced, right? Or like the, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say that maybe so definitively because there are coercion scenarios where it's mostly like nonverbal boundaries and physical boundaries that get kind of established and then get kind of blown past. Like, you know, the scenario of like, hey, baby, what are you doing here? And then you can like physically turn away. You try to ignore them. You don't ever say like, stop talking to me because this is part of the problem is when you are with people you don't know very well, even people you know, like you never know what's going to make somebody like start a physical altercation or force the issue. And you might not feel safe and secure saying no in a very blunt and direct way and you might feel like you have to or literally have to be like oh no sorry i have a boyfriend or or just like trying to walk away trying to like desperately make eye contact with a friend to help rescue you like you got a lot of techniques to have up your sleeve when it comes to you know trying to extract yourself from a coercive scenario and just wearing people down and tell us that they say yes is not normal. Role play is fine, right? You could role play all kinds of things if you want to, but that role play is consensual to begin with. You do it that way because you both want it to be that way because you talked about it before it actually started to happen, you know? You don't get just carte blanche for like every woman on the planet if you can talk them into sex by any means necessary, you can have sex with their bodies, like no. No, 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 no. This is much more than that. You have to have something established beforehand if you want to go more in that direction of like it would be really hot if we could pretend that I'm doing this to you but then it's pretend because it's pretend because it's not real because you're not actually trying to assault somebody and like this indifference to assault is so bizarre to me this indifference of other people suffering of other people having violations happen to them it's just so weird like what worldview do you have to have in order to feel okay and not even realize what your behavior is doing to other people? Like, why can't you ever have a girlfriend? Why can't you ever get a second date? You know, why can't you get a third date? Why is it people always break up with you and get angry with you? Like, that's not normal. What's happening? What's happening? Reflect a little bit, please, dear God. Somebody's got to. Otherwise, I don't know how we're ever going to get this to change, you know? And... I think just on a final note here, what I want to talk about is like the audience reaction and how that changed over time. Because like I said with Caroline, the first TikTok, that was very much uh, skepticism. Well, we don't really know like what happened. This could just be bad communication. There was a lot of like justification about like, oh, this is just bad communication. This is just somebody who's not really good at reading the room, it's like just a common misunderstanding. And there is room for misunderstanding and for poor communication. But this really seems like a pattern. This really seems like a pattern of drinking, pursuing people, being overly aggressive, isolating them, not taking no for an answer, and then forcing the issue physically even after getting a no. And that is way more than just the like oh he's just like he gets confused he just doesn't understand body language that well like no this isn't like people were saying they were directly saying no this isn't just a body language thing at this point this is willfully ignoring a no or selectively not hearing a no 
I don't know. I don't know how I want to phrase that. But it's just weird to see how like the public perception shifted as more stories came out and it made the first one like more believable and it's like interesting how people will treat allegations like this as like a, oh we have to stay neutral we have to be skeptical we have to you know not take sides and it's I find that to be a very like fascinating way to look at things because like neutrality is not actually always the best option and I think sometimes we glorify and look to neutrality as being the gold standard of like oh you shouldn't take sides you should just remain objective right okay well you can look at the facts of something differently and come to a different conclusion based on what you think is the most likely what you put the most weight in and maintaining neutrality does not actually mean that you have like the best understanding of the truth of what happened because at the end of the day we are not these people we do not have a recording of everything that always happened every single time Andrew was with one of these people. We do not know what actually happened. We will never know. So to maintain neutrality in the face of like trying to be objective but we'll never have enough evidence to actually be fully objective. I don't know, just fence sitting is just like an interesting thing to maintain with this because at some point it starts to feel like more of an excuse to not have to believe people or support people and less just about like oh I want to be neutral because I think being neutral is best like it oftentimes it's like involves a lot of like tearing people down and needling them and I really realized there's no amount of evidence that will get people to believe something is true like across the board like and I haven't made a video about this yet maybe I will but like the Andrew Tate allegations for example are just wild they are just there's voice notes and video recordings and they wiretapped him and just, there's mountains of his own words describing everything that he did testimony from many many individuals again wiretaps even and even then people will go well we need to see what happens in court we need to make sure we got the full story here because blah, blah, blah. and it's like there are voice notes of him saying he wants to rape people or he enjoys raping them like you're really gonna be like, well, I think we need to be objective here and stay neutral. Like, a degree of skepticism is warranted. Only being skeptical of nothing else is, I think, a little suspect to me, personally. I'm skeptical of people that are only skeptics. It's like their, their worldview is just an, the only thing they are is skeptical. I don't know. Anyways, I think that's where I'm going to end this video for now. Thank you all for listening to my rambles about this and my thoughts. I really do think that coercion is a very big problem and I realize I kind of wanted to talk in this video about like better techniques to like not coerce people but like honestly it really just comes down to like if somebody says no take them at their word don't try to convince them I think we need to have a social sh shift around not having this expectation like oh women are hard to get you have to convince them like as we move towards a world of women being like sexually free and getting to genuinely do what they want sexually that will be less of a pressure but it's very much an ongoing process and yeah just listen to a no don't badger people it's not gonna ruin the mood to ask for consent I promise if somebody wants to have sex with you hearing the phrase would you like it if I or could I or would you be able to like whatever hearing those words is not going to kill the mood and if it does that is very much an extreme outlier so i take my chances personally if if it's a choice between mild temporary turnoff and assaulting someone without knowing it or assaulting somebody and ignoring it maybe even is a better way of thinking about that probably gonna probably gonna be more conservative probably gonna choose the one that is less of a destructive thing for somebody's life i don't know that's me though anyways again that's all my thoughts all my feelings let me know what you guys think in a comment down below and especially in regards to coercion what do you guys think is the solution here what would you guys want to see moving forward in terms of like i don't know sex ed or conversations like should i talk about this more what should i talk about in regards to coercion i think this is again a very big issue 
I would love to know your thoughts. If you're not already, please do subscribe. Thank you all so, so much. If you do support me over on Patreon. And that's going to be it, guys. Stay safe out there. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Thank you.